Hello, hello, hello. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain upon you always. And especially during this episode of The Jolly Heretic, because today what we are going to talk about is religion. And specifically, we are going to talk about the so-called religion IQ nexus, the relationship between religiousness and intelligence. Now, this has been this is very, very interesting. And it's something that people have been testing all the way back to the 1920s. That was the first time people looked into the relationship with it, uh, in, uh, between the two. They wanted to know, um, basically, are uh, religious people less intelligent than, than non-religious people? Do they have lower IQ? Do, do, do religious people have lower IQ than atheists? And what was found again and again and again is that they do indeed have lower IQ, all the way back to the 1920s. Um, the, the, the last major meta-analysis of this was by a guy called Zuckerman. Um, it was published in about 2013, and he found that there was a relationship among population samples of all of these studies. There must have been, I think, over 100 studies, a relationship of minus 0.2. So a weak but significant relationship. And among, among um, student samples, it was minus 0.1. And I wrote a book in 2014 on this, and it was called Religion and Intelligence and Evolutionary Analysis. And again, I brought all the studies together as well and did my own analysis, and I found again it was a relationship of about, point, of about minus 0.2 that religi religious people were basically stupider than atheists. And it was... Um, uh, you know this old this old saying the 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 fool says in his heart there is no god was completely overturned it was the fool says in his heart there is a god because the person who says there is a god has lower iq on average and it doesn't matter what proxy you look at whether you look at how much people earn um, those people will tend to will be more likely, um, to, uh, or socioeconomic status, those people would more likely to be atheists if, if they have high status. If you look at how educated people are, the more educated people are, the more likely in the Western societies, and indeed in all societies across the world, the more like even like Islamic societies, the more likely they are to be atheists. If you look at the issue of, of sex, of, of, of gender, then men who have slightly higher IQ than women are more likely to be atheists than women are. If you look at Age, people reach their IQ peak, um, the, the, you know, the cleverest you'll, their intelligence peak, rather the cleverest you'll ever be, um, at around the age of sort of 40, something like that, 40, 50, 45, around, around this you know, mid, sort of early middle age, and those people are more atheistic either than younger people uh, or than older people. If you look at national IQ, we have national IQ data brought together by Richard Lynn and Tatu Vandenen in their book Intelligence, and you find there is a relationship of minus 0.6 between national IQ and um, you know how likely people are to believe in God. Um, I, there's, there's so many of these. If you look at people that have very high IQ, such as members of Mensa or members of the Royal Society, that sort of thing of scientific societies, these people are overwhelmingly atheist. Right? Overwhelmingly so. So what the data is saying is that IQ is there is a negative religiousness IQ nexus, and it's a it, it's a, it's a nexus that exists worldwide. The more intelligent, the more the higher your IQ is, the less religious you are likely to be. Um, it even works, uh, Helmut Nyborg did a study of this, it even works within religious organisations. If you compare different religious organisations, so the highest I in America, so the highest IQ um, religious group would be the uh, Episcopalians, as it were, the kind of Church of England in, in, in the USA, and those people are more, they're not actually atheists, but they're more liberal in their religiousness, they're more questioning of religiousness and of religious doctrines than are uh, very low IQ um, uh, uh, religious groups such as Baptists and snake handlers and that sort of thing. And so again and again and again, um, this relationship is replicated. It, it seems very, very clear, and it was the conclusion I came to in my book many, many years ago, that re religiousness is negatively associated with IQ. The higher your IQ is, the less religious you are likely to be. Now, why is this the case? Now, there are a number of uh, different theories behind this. Uh, one of them, the, the one that I argued in my book in 2014, was simply that the arguments for the people who are intelligence, part of intelligence is about, it's about solving problems, uh, it's therefore about the ability to reason. Um, people who have higher IQ are better at reasoning, they're less susceptible to fallacious illogical arguments, and therefore they are less susceptible to the arguments for the existence of God, such as the ontological argument, which is basically a sort of 
sort of a manipulative logical sleight of hand, or the argument for the cosmological argument, the argument for causation, Taylor logical argument, the argument for a mind behind events, the moral argument, and so on. Um, they're more logical, and they're therefore more able to see through these arguments for the existence of God, uh, and, and therefore to reject the hypothesis that there's a God. That was that was what I concluded. Um, Helmut Nyborg, a Danish psychologist, uh, he argued simply that the, the, the people who, the higher your IQ is, the more able you are to understand a scientific way of seeing the world. Everybody wants certainty, everybody wants a, a, a certain way of seeing the world because it gives them security. Um, and if you're not intelligent enough, if you're too stupid, you can't understand science. It's, it's, it, it's incomprehensible to you. It doesn't give you certainty. And uh, therefore, you go for religion because you're intelligent enough to understand, to, to, to deal with that. Um, and, and, and that gives you certainty. Another argument was put forth by a psychologist called Satoshi Kanazawa. Uh, he, he, he has, um, and, and, and he called it the Savannah IQ uh, interaction hypothesis. And um, the Savannah IQ hypothesis, and he, he argues that um, we are evolved to, to a great extent. Uh, a, a, a lot of our evil cognitive biases come from when we lived on the Savannah. Um, and Therefore, we would, and intelligence began to develop, and we began to become more intelligent and solve problems using intelligence rather than just using instinct as we left the savannah, because we had these instincts that made us evolve to the savannah. So as we left the savannah, we couldn't solve problems with instinct, and this selected for solving problems with intelligence. Um, and this meant that intelligence is evolutionarily novel, he suggests, um, and that... Um, and, and that therefore we would expect intelligence to be correlated with things which are themselves evolutionarily novel, which you wouldn't have got on the savannah. And one of the things you wouldn't have got on the savannah is atheism, and that is why there is this, this negative relationship between um, religiousness uh, and uh, atheism, because you would have got this on the savannah. It strikes me an obvious problem with that, of course, is that you wouldn't have got monotheism on the savannah either. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and this, this evolution, this, this evolutionary novel, evolutionary familiar divide is quite sort of vague. But anyway, that was his argument. An argument was put forth by myself and my colleague Dimitri van der Linden, um, and um, we, 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 we refer to it as an, it's instinct, so the idea that intelligence, if you want to solve problems, intelligence involves rising above your instincts. You can solve things instinctively, but intelligence involves not acting instinctively, not acting emotionally, being able to rise above your instincts. One of our evolved instincts is to believe in God, um, and, and to be or gods or whatever, and consequently we would expect intelligent people to be more able to rise above that instinct and to not and to to be um, to be anti-instinctive, to be attracted to things that aren't instinctive, such as atheism, and that would explain the relationship. So there are these various theories that have attempted to explain why there is this negative relationship between religiousness and IQ, but they all suffer from a fundamental flaw. And that's what I want to sort of look at, that they all suffer from a fundamental flaw. And that is that they, although they look at the relationship between, intel between IQ and uh, religiousness, they don't look at the relationship between the core intelligence and religiousness. They don't look at the relationship between general intelligence and religiousness. They assume that the IQ religiousness nexus reflects a general intelligence religiousness nexus. Now, as we discussed in other videos, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, um, re-familiarise you with it, the, the, the nature of intelli intelligence or art can, can be conceived of as a kind of a, a pyramid, if you like. You have, um, at the bottom of that pyramid, you have specialised abilities, very, very, very specific things that are very weakly correlated with, in, with a general intelligence, such as the ability to catch a ball or throw a dart or... Um, you know, um, look at the world in a highly analytical way, or these very narrow, um, you know, even social skill, these very narrow abilities. As you move above that, further up the pyramid, you have the, what we understand normally as the different components of intelligence, you know, the mathematical intelligence, linguistic intelligence, and spatial intelligence. And of course, normally, you get some people who are better at mathematical intelligence than they are at linguistic intelligence. For example, the typical tongue-tied physicist, he will probably have higher mathematical intelligence than linguistic intelligence. You get some people that are better at linguistic intelligence than mathematical intelligence. Um, a, a good example of that would be your people who are poets or writers or journalists or you know, those kinds of people. And you get some people that are very good at spatial intelligence, people like architects and, and that sort of thing. Um, now, all of these three kinds of intelligence, they correlate, they go together. So although there's variation um, in how, you know, how good you are at one compared to the other, in general, in, people who are good at one are also good at the other kinds. 
and so therefore you can conceive of a general factor of intelligence which underpins all of them, and we refer to this as G. And this is what the IQ test is trying to measure, but the IQ test is not a perfect measurer of G, because it's also measuring these other things, these specialised abilities at the foot of the pyramid that we talked about, um, and, 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 and so on. And so and we can talk about the extent to which an IQ test is G-loaded, is better or worse at, measure, at, at tapping into G, at tapping into this core ability. So, for example, the correlation between an IQ test score and how well you do on school exams. In England we have the GCSEs, these kinds of things. And um, the correlation is about 0.7. So 70% of the, it's, it's, they're 70% the same. They're measuring something to the extent of 70% the same. And this is because other things than um, in IQ will influence how well you do in your GCSEs, such as your personality, how hardworking you are, um, you know, just such as luck, whatever. Um, now with the IQ test, how hardworking you are can it can uh, um, um, interfere with how well you do to a, to a much lesser extent. But even so, how good you are at these specialised abilities can interfere with how well you do. And this is why we talked another, in another um, discussion about the Flynn effect. And this is this idea that our intelligent IQ scores have been increasing across the 20th century. Um, IQ scores have been going um, up and up and up, and they, they continue to go up in Western countries until about 1997. But they weren't going up on G. They weren't going up on the more G-loaded components of the IQ test. They were going up on the weekly G-loaded components of the IQ test. They were going up on specialised abilities, the ability to think in a very analytic, scientific way. That's what they were going up on. Um, and so, um, but the, I, the, 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 the lack of perfection of the IQ test meant that even certain, meant that, 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 that because they were going up so overwhelmingly on these specialised abilities, um, it came across on, as a rising IQ score, even though the evidence was that on general intelligence we weren't going up, um, and indeed it seems we were actually going down. You see, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's rather like thinking of height, think of the possibility of measuring height, and think of the idea that, as I've said before, that the, the, the trunk is something that's highly genetic, how big your trunk is, the legs is something highly environmental, and so people could come across over the 20th century as getting taller because their legs are getting longer, despite the fact that at the genetic level, at the level of, of, of if you like, core tallness, at the level of the G of tallness, at the, um, they were actually getting shorter. But even so, it, the, the, the way that we measure height is uh, that way would mean that we were coming across as taller, um, even though on a certain level we were getting shorter. It's rather like that with the Flynn effect. So um, you get this, uh, <coughs> this potential problem um, with with the IQ test and so forth and how and how G loaded it is and so the fundamental question yeah, yeah yes it's clear it's clear that religiousness is negatively associated with IQ but the fundamental question is does that mean religious people are less intelligent is religiousness associated with being lower on G now um, if they are less intelligent, then of course some of the, these, these theories that I've discussed, this, the, the Savannah IQ interaction hypothesis um, and, and this sort of thing, um, those, those would work. And we would perhaps be able to explain the fact that you come across highly intelligent religious people sometimes by the fact that they're very high in certain personality traits, maybe, such as agreeableness, let's say, um, and, and, or mental neuroticism, and this overwhelms their intelligence and of course you can get that you can get people who are, who are very very intelligent perhaps you get this among social justice warriors sometimes but they, they can't think in a logical way about certain things because of the kind of personality they have and that's what I argued in my book religion and intelligence but but relatively recently I came across a, a, I came across a quite brilliant study by a chap called Jonathan Metzen who's German, and I'm currently working with him on a, on a, on a paper, it's under the second round of peer review at the moment, on this, uh, on this very area. And what he showed is that the relationship, for the first time, and it's really incredible considering that this has been being tested for almost a hundred years, and no one's ever looked at it, um, what he showed was that the relationship between religiousness and IQ is not on G. 
And what that means is that religious people, when it comes to the core of intelligence, religious people have lower IQ than atheists, but they are not less intelligent. And he showed this by comparing a number of religious groups in the Netherlands, um, each of which had different average IQ scores. He was able to extrapolate the, how well these groups did on the G-loaded, on the more or less G-loaded parts of the test. And what he showed was there was the, was the Spearman's hypothesis, which is that differences between groups on IQ will tend to be on G was not confirmed. What he showed was that there wasn't what's called a Jensen effect. What he showed was that the difference was not on the more G-loaded subtests. It was on the less G-loaded subtests. So the, the fool says in his heart there is no God is not necessarily true, but what can be said is that there is no relationship between religiousness and intelligence, between religiousness and IQ Yes, but between religiousness and intelligence, no. It's not on G. And that, I think, is an absolutely amazing, and it's such a, an important, I go so far as saying sexy finding, a sexy finding. OK, so what's going on? Well, there we can have quite a good guess. And as far as I can work out, the key factor is basically autism. So there was a study by somebody called, uh, a number of studies by, in, in the, the, the Zuckerman meta-analysis, there was a study by someone called, a number of studies by someone called Penny Cook. And he gave um, samples an IQ test, and he also gave them what's called a cognitive um, reflectivity test. And this test, although it does measure intelligence to some extent, it also is a, basically a measure of autism. And what, it, what it, people who are autistic do well, uh, uh, you know, they, 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 they score in a certain way on this test. They do well on this test because, um, because what this is testing is the ability to think in a purely analytical way. What autism is about is systematizing. Now, this is, relates to intelligence, but it's not exactly the same thing as intelligence. It, it relates to systematizing. Autistics are obsessed with systematizing. And at the other extreme, but they are very low in empathy and they don't allow extraneous information to get in the way of their obsession with systematizing. Where at the other extreme, you get the, the, the what would I call the empath, I suppose, who is obsessed with empathy for other people and very, very bad at systematizing. But autistics are obsessed with systematizing. And what Penny Cook found is that when you control for how well people do on this cognitive reflection test, then the relationship between IQ and, in, and religiousness becomes non-significant. It doesn't exist anymore. And so what this means is that it is how well you're doing on the cognitive reflection test that is driving this relationship. It's the mediator. It's the cause. It's nothing to do with actual, actually how clever you are. It's to do with the fact that the IQ test is picking up on intelligence, but it's also picking up on an ability, at the base of the intelligence pyramid, the same ability I would suggest that the Flynn effect is picking up on, which is this ability to categorize, this ability to systematize, which is weakly related to G. Now, I, I think that's absolutely fascinating. Um, and uh, we know, in fact, that autistics, um, they do particularly well on the aspects of, of the IQ test that are about mentalizing, that are about this ability, that, 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 that are about this, they do well on the specific IQ tests, on, on the ravens. So the ravens test um, is, is just about these little puzzles, about systematizing, there's nothing getting in the way of it, like language or whatever, and, and uh, knowledge. And that's what they do the best on, because what they are obsessed with is systematizing. So this is what seems to be causing um, the relationship. And consistent with this, autism is associated with being low in uh, religiousness. There is an extent to which religious belief involves feeling empathy for people. And indeed, religiousness correlates with agreeableness, um, the essence of which um, is empathy. It involves 
being able to apprehend a mind, understand a mind, the mind of others, empathy. And that's what autistics are very bad at. What, what people who are non-autistic, they, they, can, can they can see how the mind of others works from social cues and, social, and signals. And autistics can't do that. And it would seem to me to follow that, you, um, that an ordinary person can perhaps see evidence of the workings of a mind in the world itself. And that's why you get the teleological argument, which is the idea that the, the world is showing us that there must be a mind behind it. Look at all the way it all works together and stuff. Um, no, autistics don't think like that. They can't conceive of a mind behind anything. They just conceive of cold, mechanical systems. Um, and um, indeed, there was a study by someone called Karpinski who found that the, at the extreme levels, people who have very high IQ tend to have the kind of autistic traits because they're so extremely good um, at, uh, at, at systematizing. Um, there was a test by, I think the name was Heinsky or something like this, and he found that you know, it's, it's autistics that are higher on this kind of thin effect type of the systematizing uh, aspect of the, I, of the IQ test. Um, there were studies by somebody called Caldwell and her team, and she found that whereas um, on her sample, um, eighth among the autistic sample, the extent of atheism was considerably higher uh, than among what she called the neurotypical sample. There was a study by Norin Zion who found that that there is a relationship, a negative relationship between religiousness and how autistic you are, and what is driving that is the inability to mentalize, that is to say, the inability to empathize, the inability to conceive of the minds of others. So autistics are literally less religious because of their focus on systematizing, which means that they can't focus on, on, on empathy. There was another study by someone called Azari, uh, which um, looked at sort of brain waves, brain patterns, this kind of thing. And it found that the essence of when people pray, what lights up in their mind are parts of the brain that are involved in empathy, in talking to another person, in empathizing with another person. So the essence of being religious is basically not being autistic. And this perhaps would explain why schizophrenia, which in some respects is the opposite of autism, because schizophrenia involves being obsessed with people's signals of people's internal states to the extent that you overanalyze them and you become paranoid about them and you, you see evidence of conspiracies and of a mind working everywhere. Um, this would be why uh, uh, schizophrenics tend to be overwhelmingly uh, religious because they, they, they are quite the opposite of autistics um, in this way. So the essence of religiousness, therefore, seems to be a moderate level of schizophrenia, a moderate degree to which you, you over empathize. And this leads you, therefore, to see the presence of a mind in signals from from the world. This means that you can enter a trance-like state, and in that trance-like state you, you reach a kind of instinct where you feel the presence of an, another mind, and you communicate with that person like a friend, and you pray to them, and you try to understand what it is that other person thinks, and what it is that other person wants, and what makes the other person happy. Um, in the words of Lady Gaga, I kneel down and pray to try to make the world feel better, I think she said, uh, see through the leather. Anyway, I can't remember what it was, but 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 yes, it's um, so it's it's autism, it's autism that's driving this, and it's the relationship between um IQ. It's the fact that the higher you, the higher, the better you do on an IQ test, the more autistic you will basically be. That autism traits predict doing well on IQ. They only weakly, very weakly, associate with intelligence itself. At, I, at the very, very high level, people who are super, super intelligent, and the essence of intelligence is problem solving, and therefore the essence of intelligence is basically systematizing. Um, those, you know, those people who are super, super intelligent, those people seem to have evidence of, of autistic traits, um, which is very, including even things like being obsessed with noise and, and, and light, because they can take in so much information, and the more information you take in, the better you can solve a problem. But this means that they're aware of so much information that they can become completely overwhelmed, rather like autistics. Uh, but it's, it's autism um, that's driving this. And I think that's a very important finding. Very important. I'm absolutely, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely over the moon. And, it dem and because it, the media love it. They love 
research that is published show that basically, as far as they're concerned, proves that religious people are stupid. They love it because of this, as I'm sure you all know, this cultural Marxism agenda, which tries to destroy tradition, which tries to destroy everything which holds society together, which tries to destroy, um, you know, in, uh, so, so, so that our, our bonds with the past can be broken, so that our sense of who we are can be broken, and so that we can all become just these automata that buy things, or worse still, we can be indoctrinated with um, something else like multiculturalism or something like that. And, so, um, and whereas um, tradition is, and, and our connection with tradition is, of course, a protector um, against that, because there's a strong degree to which religiousness is associated with, um, as I have shown in other videos, is associated with ethnocentrism, is associated with thinking about the good of your group, um, is associated with you know, you know wanting the good of your really your ethnic group because religion is forty percent genetic and tends to be passed on and so um, in in this kind of way and so therefore although it's a different thing from um, your genetic interests it does parallel it and if there's good evidence to say that that, that uh, the more ethnocentric a society is uh, uh, the more religious it tends to be the more religious it tends to be, the more ethnocentric it tends to be religiousness traditionally it promotes basically evolutionarily adaptive forms of behaviour. And so you, if you break religiousness, if you destroy religiousness, you're basically making people less adapted to, uh, to survive, less ethnocentric, and less likely to pass on their genes. And this, I suspect, is why the cultural Marxist media love articles, love research which proves that religious people are stupid, because that's how they interpret this religion IQ research. Religious is stupid. They love it, because they can denigrate religion, they can denigrate, denigrate tradition, and they can denigrate that which... Um, hold society together and which, and which, and which helps to, 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 to be a, something that stands in the way of their agenda. They love it. And when I did this paper with uh, Dimitri van der Linden on this, it got, lo it got loads and loads of publicity because as far as they were concerned, it was showing that religious people are stupid. But what we're seeing now is religious people are not stupid. There is no difference in core intelligence. They may be less good at analysing in a totally you know, analytic emotion-free way. Um, the, the, you know, less good, you know, there may be some levels at which, i.e. religious dogmas, where they'll, where they'll stop thinking in an analytic way. But in all other respects of daily life, they are not less intelligent. And therefore, you shouldn't be surprised that you tend to find, indeed you do find, that um, at undergraduate level, science students are actually, are actually more religious than humanities students. And science students actually tend to be more intelligent than humanities students. And you can look for my, in my book, Religion and Intelligence, for the data on that. That's, what, that's what's going on. Um, because the humanities students, though they are less intelligent, are lower in agreeableness and conscientiousness. And these are the two, these are the two um, personality traits that predict uh, religiousness. And they're lower in that, so they're more atheistic. So, religious people are not less intelligent. There is no difference in intelligence between religious people and atheists. And so the take-home message is if you want to use this area of psychology to denigrate religiousness and by extension denigrate, denigrate tradition and uh, denigrate that which will hold a society and its ethnic interests together, you can no longer do so. So there you go. I think it's a fascinating area of research. I want to look at it in much, much more detail. Anyway, if you have enjoyed this um, this video, then please subscribe. Um, because if you subscribe, I, I basically, I, I have to tell you, I'd be perfectly blunt about, about this, I just get more money. So, you know, I would more be able to make videos. So please subscribe. Uh, please follow me on Twitter, at Jolly Heretic. Um, you can um, you can also find me if you're a really really nice person and God is God is with you on Patreon uh, or on Subscribestar. You can follow me on Gad uh, uh, Gab sorry at Jolly Heretic. And if you follow me, I tell you if you follow me on Subscribestar, if you follow me on Subscribestar or Patreon or give me money through PayPal, I can guarantee you a very high place at God's right hand in the kingdom of heaven. So so you know think think on think on about that about the importance of you know eschatologically. Of, uh, of subscribing um, and, of, and of giving me a bit of, a bit of funding. Um, and let me just finish by saying uh, a quick quote from the Song of Songs in the Bible. How beautiful you are and how pleasing, my love, with your delights. Your stature is like that of a palm and your breasts are like clusters of fruit. I said 
I will climb that palm. I will hold, take hold of its fruit. May your breasts be like clusters of grapes on the vine. And the fragrance of your breath like apples and your mouth like fine wine. That's from Song of Songs 7. Yeah. So think about it. And I hope you have enjoyed this episode of Jolly Heretic. And feel free to get in touch if you have any ideas. And goodbye. And God bless you.